started. I'm always a fan of starting on time and ending early if you can. And so welcome to our December Dark Tap meeting. Okay, he was just here. <laughs> I'm going to invite John to come up and welcome all of you to Oakland University, and then we will get started with our agenda. Well, thanks. It's great to see everybody. I mean, I'm just delighted to be at things where I can wear shoes, which is just great. Um, I was talking, well, I've been talking to Diane, and, and the last time we saw each other was uh, fall 2019, she reminded me. And um, it's been tough. I, I don't know about you all, but uh, it's, it's been a challenge. Uh, and it's just so great to be in a room with each of you and, and uh, to some extent to commiserate. I, I will have to admit to doing a certain amount of commiserating, but also to have an opportunity to look forward. I, I think there's some really great signs at the state level when we got here from the state. And I think, um, I know for us, our new teacher ed programs are looking promising, and I'm, I'm hearing about that around the state. And so uh, just, it's great to be in a room with you all. Um, I know that I just, on a personal note, turned 60, which is a little hard for you. But some of you all I've known for a third of my life. Yeah, I, I, Doug, I've known you since I don't know when. It's just great to see everybody in the room together and to be together. And uh, last thing to say before I give this back over is um, Oakland is, it, it, so I'm supposed to welcome you to Oakland, so I'll do that. Uh, the building you're standing in is about twice the size it was five years ago. Uh, you'll see cranes around the uh, around the place uh, we're able to build. Uh, it's a beautiful place that I love and believe in. And I hope you have a chance to, to look around a little bit and see some of the things that we've got. Because uh, we love this place. It, it's classic Michigan. And uh, welcome. I'm really glad you're here. It doesn't like that. Um, first thing on our agenda is approval of the October minutes. I want to thank Lori also for taking minutes of the that meeting. She graciously agreed to take the minutes meeting on the Luke was sent out to you earlier. We, you were encouraged to take a look at it ahead of time. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? Thank you, Lisa. Second. Yeah. Any discussion on that? Now, those in favor, say aye. Opposed? Abstain. I'm mean, going to change the order of that one a little bit for a couple of things, but we'll do it this way for now. The next item on our business list is the election of a chair elect. We're going to change the order of it. But we put out a call earlier in the fall, and we had one nomination. It's Diane Brown, Santa Heights. We have no other nominations coming forward. So with that, I'd like to kind of, we're going to reverse the order, but elect, move forward with the election of Diane to the chair elect. Um, I promised her that I would stay on and help her as much as I could next year too, because I was supposed to be chair elect this year. So we're going to move this forward a little bit. With this election process, we're going to ask since Diane has agreed to be resident, those opposed, and our line will also be by that. Those abstaining, those in favor, say aye. Congratulations, Diane. <laughs> With that, I'm going to turn the mic over to Beth. Um, so our treasurer's report, I've been collecting dues. Many of you are paid up. We're very happy about that. Um, Brian, if you want to click. Um, oh, I didn't know that they were all one at a time. Go ahead, just click through the whole list. We have about 25 institutions that have paid. If you don't see your institution on here, please check in with me today. I forgot to bring my virtual terminal with me, so I'm not able to take dues at today's meeting. Um, but next week, you can give me a call, and I'm uh, happy to take those. You're also welcome to write a check. Um, our dues go to pay for events like this. And so we would love to have um, your institution's uh, dues paid up. Right now, our balance as of November 30th is $16,886.53. So fortunately, we're in great shape. 
Um, on a side note, I would like to thank um, our Dean, John Marjorie Lane, who has agreed to uh, cover the cost of breakfast and lunch today, uh, which uh, greatly helps uh, DART have out. So again, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, ben Bradshaw from Hope College. Uh, I've been on the Mackey board since 2017, believe it or not. Um, and so it's been uh, a few years. Uh, uh, I think the bylaws say three years. So why I've been on since then, I don't know. Um, Mackey's been busy this fall. Um, Hope College did a little study for case uh, for uh, standard 1.4 uh, for Kate. And that case study correlated teachers' growth data scores to their end of year evaluation scores. Now, anybody that knows about uh, evaluations of teachers in the state of Michigan knows that 40% of a teacher's evaluation comes from that growth data score. And so I thought it would be really smart to see if we could tie those two things together because what do we get from the state every year? We get end of year evaluation scores. But that really doesn't tell us how uh, much impact a teacher has in the classroom specifically. So now we've done this three or four years in a row. So Mackie this fall decided, let's take this little case study that I've been doing and let's take it to the state level. And so uh, we collected data from all of the different regions in the state and we performed this same little case study and son of a gun if we didn't get the same results that we've had uh, just with my little case study that I had been doing, which is going to be really good for all of us moving forward when we need to show some impact on standard 4.1 moving forward. Um, I think the, the key thing is that we can't rely 100% on this kind of work because I'm gonna tell you that it's the most unreliable and invalid set of data that you can imagine. Uh, getting growth data scores from individual buildings and districts is uh, is really tough. But anyway, it's one piece of the whole puzzle for your standard 4.1. So that's something that we've been working on all fall. I also want to mention the whole conference, um, the accreditation conference that we've been running every year. I am to tell you that this will be the last year that it will be held at Hope College. Mainly because my job will be shifting at the end of this year. And if I am back at Hope next fall, it will be at a slightly different uh, level than what I've been doing for the last few years. And so um, I won't have the time, honestly, to help put this thing together. So this will be your last year to come to Hope in April when we don't know if it's going to snow or be 70 degrees. <laughs> Um, um, April 12 and 13 are your Wednesday and Thursday dates of the conference. Uh, the Hayworth Hotel, if any of you have been on our campus and have stayed at that hotel, has been completely redone. You will not recognize it. Um, the rooms are unbelievable. It's become much more of a little boutique kind of hotel. Uh, much more, there's a big e-coffee right in the entryway. But it's 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 a fabulous facility. Still have about 45 rooms at that hotel available to us for the conference. I've also uh, set up with City Flats Hotel in downtown Holland um, for a little block uh, rate there as well. Costs are up, folks. Hate that. Um, it's going to be a little bit more expensive than it's been in the past, but we're we're, we're doing everything we can to keep those costs down. The committee uh, that has helped put this together had its first meeting yesterday, and we will be meeting uh, every Thursday for the month of December, right up until Christmas. Um, and so think about accreditation at your institution, and please think about what help do you want? What do you want to talk about? And I will be putting out just a, on the list, or just a, a request for ideas for the conference. And I will be doing that this week, because we will be talking about it next Thursday. So look for an e email from me through the listener uh, that just asked, uh, is there a topic that you'd like the committee to explore and put together for our conference in April? So that's the Mac report for now. Thank you, Bill. Uh, for Michigan Public Deans, we have not met since well, at a start tech meeting, but we are continuing to move forward and we are planning a spring retreat 
And at that spring retreat, we're also going to do the feed by hunt. And so we'll be moving forward with that this spring. We are currently following the legislation updates and like that. We're all kind of concerned about what might happen during the lane down presentation. So our executive committee meetings monthly. And those are the main things that we're looking at right now is planning our spring retreat, spring meeting, and keeping an eye on what things we need to be watching for that might be happening. So that's the Michigan Public Beans update. And we do not have an update at this point for my time because they haven't had a chance to meet either. It's been busy for a lot of us. I am going to power through slides pretty quickly because I want to set a stage. And then what I'd like to do is to give it to you and to your comments and your questions, if we could, please. And um, really talk about the ways in which we are working to address the teacher shortage and prepare young people it's to on, right? younger people in our schools. Amen. Just look at that. Come on, there we go. Okay. Turn it on Friday morning. Let's go. All right. So our state's top 10 strategic education plan has eight goals. These are the eight goals in, uh, in front of you. The seventh of those eight goals is addressing the teacher shortage. Next slide, please. We have had uh, some difficulty, um, surprisingly, over a period of years, getting the state legislature to acknowledge that there is a teacher shortage. When I started this job three and a half years ago, I know it's crazy, isn't it? When I started the job three and a half years ago, I went into a number of legislative offices and said, you know, we have a teacher shortage. We need your support. And legislators said, well, yeah, yeah, maybe in some districts, but not in ours. And I can remember one particular state legislator who shall remain nameless, Speaker Chatfield. <laughs> and um, he, he essentially ignored me until I said to him, you know, Speaker, I'm going to be in your district in three weeks. And I want you to know that I'm going to be meeting with superintendents and principals in your district. And if you are right, and in fact, there is no teacher shortage, I will be calling you up and saying that I was wrong. If, on the other hand, they say what I think they're going to say, which is there is a teacher shortage in uh, the Eastern Upper Peninsula, then they're going to be calling you and telling you that you were wrong. Well, I mean, TikTok goes the clock, and, and we know the answer to, to, this, to this issue. It took us the better part of three years to shake money loose from the state legislature. We got $5 million in 21 for teacher retention bonuses. We got a little bit more than a million and a half dollars um, in fiscal year 22. Last year, about this time, um, November of 21, we put forth a plan to um, three hundred to five hundred million dollars into addressing the teacher shortage. We asked the uh, governor for her support on this. We asked the state legislature for its support on this. We asked them to act before spring. They did not, um, but they did act um, at the very beginning of the summer, and they gave us five hundred seventy-five million dollars. Much of that money will end up in your institutions. We can go to the next slide, please. Of the $575 million, and for those of you who like to sum numbers and say that the speaker can't sum, I know these don't sum to $575 million already. $305 million for so-called teacher fellowships, scholarships, $175 million for Grow Your Own support staff to become teachers, $50 million for young people to have stipends or, or older people to have stipends with their student teaching, because we know that we're in a different market, amen? We're not in a, uh, a buyer's market anymore. As a local superintendent for 17 years, first in New Jersey and, and then in Michigan, for a number of years, I was in a buyer's market. I had enormous numbers of applicants for particular positions in New Jersey, and then they began to diminish and diminish and diminish. And, and, and I moved to uh, Michigan, or moved back to Michigan, and uh, we had pretty good numbers of applicants and then skinnier and skinnier and skinnier pools. We're not in a buyer's market anymore. We're in a seller's market at this point. And because we're in a seller's market, we have to incentivize in a different way. We can't expect young people to student teach and pay for the privilege of student teaching. We, we have to pay them in a fashion 
for that um, for that effort. And, and this was the logic of recommending this idea, these ideas to the governor, to the state legislature. And this was among a menu of a dozen ideas that we put forward. These were the major ideas that were funded. You see $10 million to ISDs to recruit and hire career technical education instructors as well. Next slide, please. So I wanted to share a little bit about where we are in the profession because uh, a number of us experienced, raise your hand if you were in this business in 2011. There you go. So you remember the, the horrific uh, moment when the state legislature cut $470 per child from uh, our foundation allowance. And the consequence of that, the, the consequence of having to take cuts in pay, having to pay substantially uh, or substantially more for health insurance, having a different uh, retirement system and a different retirement contribution rate associated with that system. The, the issue of layoffs, the issue of, of, um, of not just layoffs, but the juggling of positions, all of that destabilized the profession. I'm happy to give you these slides. If you want to take pictures, it's all good, but I, I'll give you this presentation, um, promise. Um, the consequence of that is we went from 23,000 people preparing for the profession to a half decade later, 9,500 people preparing for the profession. That's a, that's a hot mess. Um, not why I'm showing you this slide. I'm showing you the slide to show you the history. So I'm showing you the slide to show you the decline from 23,000 plus to 9,500. But I'm also showing you the last four years because we are, we are coming back. Now, it was hard to see that last year in the midst of a pandemic, but it is easier to see it now. Take East Point, for example. My friends in East Point were looking for 43 positions in September of uh, last year. This year, they were looking for eight at the beginning of the year. Brian McLeod almost reversed his retirement plans. Um, I mean, in all, in all seriousness, it's a better year, not simply in East Point, but in many places across the state. I'm not saying we've arrived. We've got a lot of hard work in front of us, but we've already begun to reverse that, that downward trend. That nadir, um, one could argue, was last year, that last ugly year of the pandemic. What you'll see also in these numbers is that the completers have not rebounded. The teacher prep enrollment has, the completers have not. And of course, until you reach completer status, you can't go into a school and as a certificated teacher and do, do what you need to do on behalf of children. So we've got work in front of us on the one hand, but we've made progress on the other. Next slide, please. And I want to unpack this a little bit because it's not simply about quantity and quality of teachers. It's also about diversity of teachers. And some of you may uh, feel that as strongly as I do, and others of you may feel that less strongly, but I'm going to make a case for diversity as well, if I could, please. Um, and I'm going to unpack this chart in a couple of ways. So the top is teacher FTE counts. The bottom is student FTE counts. Stay um, in the, the top rows for a moment, please. Top left teacher FTE counts. You will notice that in 15-16, we were 91.8% white, 8.2% teachers of other ethnicities. You move forward to last year, we were 90.2% white, 9.8% teachers of other ethnicities. And some people say, well, that doesn't sound like a big deal. That doesn't sound like much of a change. Well, actually, 1.6 percentage points doesn't sound like a big change. But 1,500 new teachers of color does sound like big movement in the last half decade. We've got lots of work to do in this area, but we've also made strides in this area as well. If you go down to the bottom rows, student FTE counts, you will notice that our student body in 1516 was 67% um, white, 33% children of color. You go to uh, last year and 
we had moved to 35.4% of color. Now let's look at ratios. Let's look at the ratio of uh, teachers of color to students of color. Teachers of color to students of color. And what you can see in 1516, that the ratio of students of color to teachers of color was about four to one. Our students of color four times more likely to be diverse than our, than our teachers. You look at it in 21-22, that ratio had dropped to 3.6 to 1. And again, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it's 1,500 more FTEs of color teaching our young people in classrooms across the state. So we are bending these curves. We are actively talking about this everywhere we go, not simply with you, but every presentation that I make on teacher shortage, I talk about it in terms of quantity and quality as well as diversity, and I ask you to do the same thing. When we look at Grow Your Own programs, we are actively looking, not simply about quantity and quality, but we're also looking at diversity as well. We are pulling from more diverse catches, and we are likely to get a more diverse profession as a result. When we look at support staff to teachers, support staff workforce, is on average more diverse than the teacher workforce. So to recruit from support staff with brilliant relationships with kids already in many, many cases, the foundation, by the way, of strong teaching, when we recruit from that workforce, we're likely to get a more diverse teacher workforce on the back end. The same is true recruiting broadly from our student body rather than narrowly from our student body recruiting broadly from the student body. We push Grow Your Own programs, not simply support staff to teachers, but also students to teachers as well. And we think that's important as early as middle school. We're not pushing kids, but we're offering kids opportunities to understand what a neat career this can be, how cool this can be. I started working with kids um, when I was 14 years old as a summer camp counselor and worked in summer camps for a number of years, learned kids, and learned that I wanted to work with children for a living. Let's go to the next slide, please. So over the last six years, there's been an increase in the number of uh, Black slash African American teachers, Hispanic slash Latino teachers. If you look at this slide, the percentage, the share of uh, Black teachers as a portion of the entire teacher pie has gone up from 5.72% to 7% in the last six years. Similarly, the increase in Hispanic teachers from 1.14% to 1.31%, they don't sound like big increases, but what do they mean in terms of raw numbers? Let's go to the next slide, please. So the increase in black teachers is more than 1,000, it's 1,167. African American teacher increase in the last six years. The increase in Hispanic teachers, 169 teacher increase again in the last six years. I think that the, the next couple of slides share the same information. Go to the next slide. So you can see, you can see that. I'm not sure why we decided to say more than 1160, um, but I'll, I'll let you in on a secret. If you don't uh, tell anybody, it's 1167. And then the increase in Latino teachers, 169. We're, we've by no means arrived. My point is we are, we are improving. And I think it's, it's helpful to take a moment and celebrate those improvements um, as we work on greater improvements. I want to share three specific efforts um, that we are undertaking in some cases with, with you um, and members uh, of your of your teams and your universities, and in some cases with, with others. So registered teacher apprenticeships were announced um, just a few weeks ago in Saginaw. This is an opportunity to learn uh, while you earn money. It's an opportunity to walk up your understanding of the profession. There are registered apprenticeships in a wide range of fields that are supported by the U.S. Department of Labor. Registered teacher apprenticeships are, are relatively recent vintage, not the concept, but the funding associated with these, you know, the value of walking up 
your knowledge base, walking up your, your skill accumulation, getting money while you walk that up, not walking away from coursework, but having so much embedded training, so much on the job work, we think that there's a value to that. When teachers fail and when they get shown the door, they do not, as a rule, um, get fired because of content knowledge. Um, and they don't get fired because of instructional methodology, notwithstanding the fact that, that some of us are deadeningly bored in class. But that's not why people lose their, their jobs. And you could argue that they should. And I am not arguing that content knowledge and instructional methodology are unimportant. So don't, don't, don't come after me in a couple minutes in Q&A about that, because it's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is, you rise and fall in your relationships with children. And you need to learn children as you are learning content, as you are learning instructional methodology. You can learn children. You can learn how to interact with and connect with children far earlier than you can the content or the instructional methodology. And we should be working with young people on working with young people as early as possible, middle school, in the high school, in the college, into the career. And that's where we get stronger relationships. That's where we get stronger teachers. That's where we repair the leaks in the pipeline. Among other things, we have to pay people better. We have to incentivize people better. We have to give people more voice in the profession. But we also have to teach young people how to work with young people. You don't spring from the womb knowing how to work as a, as a teacher. And I, I particularly think this is important in urban school areas where we have a lot of teachers. They, they, they grow up in rural or suburban jurisdictions. They're placed or they get hired in urban areas. They want to do a good job. They're smart, they're caring, all those good things, but they do not know the children and the children don't know them and they don't know how to connect with the kids. And it's their responsibility. They get paid after all. They're adults after all. It's their responsibility to connect with the young people, not the responsibility of the young people to connect with them. But they have a longer learning curve. We start them off earlier in this inculcation, in this, in this training. And if we pay them to, to do so, we're going to develop stronger teachers. That's my view. Um, and uh, you know, so the, so the expression goes, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. So these registered teacher apprenticeships are not going to be a fad. They are going to be a, a, a larger and larger and larger part of how we do what we do. There's going to be very, there is federal money associated with this. There's going to be more federal money associated with this. I anticipate that the feds are going to lean into this hard. We are going to lean into this hard in the, um, the state. We are so appreciative of, of the, the initial partnership um, with Saginaw Valley State University, Saginaw ISD, some of the Saginaw area um, LEAs. But the idea that this is a Saginaw thing, not. We will be doing this with Michigan School for the Deaf, for which the Michigan Department of Education is responsible. There are other communities that are already exploring registered teacher apprenticeships. There is a, a consortium, uh, which you, um, many of you have, have just heard about, uh, Talent Together, consortium of ISDs, and it has an interest in this, um, in this model. So don't, don't look at this as a sideshow. Look at this as something that's integral uh, moving, moving forward. Go to the next, um, and, and I might add, if I could, just, just one other thing. You yeah, know, we go to the next slide. Thank you. Some people hear this as we're being replaced, not the point, okay? Teachers are still gonna need bachelor's degrees, still going to need to go through ed prep programs, still gonna to need to pass the MTPC. This is not a lowering of the bar, not a lowering of the bar, not cutting ed prep institutions out of the game. There is none of that. We did not hustle more than a half billion dollars from the state legislature to walk away from our partners in higher education. So I, I don't want you to hear registered teacher apprenticeships as moving your cheese. It does change your cheese. 
um, but it will not remove your um, your, your cheese. So like that's a that's a stinky analogy. <laughs> that's deep rolling. Sorry, I'm here all week, folks. You haven't heard the one about Swiss cheese being holy. <laughs> What do you want? Dads tell dad jokes. Um, so residency programs are huge. Um, a number of you are in this space. Kudos to Saginaw Valley State, to Northern Michigan University, to Aquinas. To those of you who, who believe in the in the power of this, some of you can say, well, we, we all have residency programs in one fashion or another. I understand that. We lift these particular programs up uh, for your reflection. Go to the next slide. And then discipline-specific expedited programs. You think about um, English language, uh, former English language learners um, who, um, who, are, who are here. Um, they, they can, um, if, if helped, become uh, ESL teachers. They can become world language teachers. They can become bilingual education teachers. For that matter, uh, other content areas as, um, as well. And so we want to uh, lift up and encourage your innovation in this area as well. I could see a place um, in the not too distant future where um, different universities in the states are, are the, um, the developers, the primary developers of particular aspects of the teacher profession. Over the last few years, we've broken down the, the need to be in space with one another. There are pros to that, there are cons to that. Uh, but you can't say it hasn't happened. And the, the power of that is that you can be in, the, um, in Southeast Michigan and be developed uh, by a program in the Upper Peninsula. So as we reflect upon how we support the profession moving forward, we're gonna increasingly be incentivizing innovation, innovation among our LEAs, innovation among our ISDs, innovation among our EPIs. We're gonna be incentivizing partnerships that you might have, that you might come forward with in some way, shape or form. We have not lifted the moratorium on new ed prep institutions. Um, our state board uh, permits that, um, that the, our structure in the state is that the state board is responsible for um, the approval of programs in ed prep institutions and uh, those outside of ed prep institutions, alternative programs are the province of the state superintendent and the state board of the state department of education. Ultimately, the state department recommends um, for the traditional programs to the state board. Uh, we are not lifting that moratorium this year. We originally were discussing the lifting of that moratorium. We've decided to lean into the space of innovation and innovating with you over this period of time. And if we feel like we need to lift that moratorium, we will. But right now, what we think we need to do is to work hard in this in this innovative space and do the best that we can uh, in partnership with you, with LEAs, with ISDs across the state. I do want to uh, recognize uh, Dr. Sarah Kate Levan, our uh, interim um, uh, director, of the Office of Educator Excellence. Sarah Kate, could you do the Queen's Wave? There you go. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Sean Kotke, who's our interim assistant director. There we go. We've got a King's Way in there. Um, um, could our other department staff please please uh, give waves, please? There we go. Beautiful. Okay. OEE -E in the house. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, we want to be as supportive as we can of you because in partnering with you, we build a better profession for kids. You look at those top 10 goals. Can we go back to the very last, the very first slide, please? Look at these goals, the way these goals are structured. 
The last two goals are upstream resource goals. They affect everything else downstream. We get the teaching profession right. We get funding right. It affects everything else resource downstream. You look at goals one, two, and three, the developmental upstream goals, the expansion of early childhood education, the improvement of early literacy, the improvement of health, safety, and wellness. We do better developmentally upstream, we'll do better developmentally downstream. One could argue, I would argue, particularly given the generational budget that was approved six months ago, um, that the goal that we just, that I've just presented on and that you're about to um, weigh in on is the most important goal facing um, Michigan public education and perhaps American public education currently. We've got to get this right to get everything else right. Thank you very much. Be well. So, questions? And where the mic to Good morning, Dr. Rose. Thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. I live in Detroit and have worked in Detroit. I now work in further southeast Michigan. What is the role of charters in this? Because I have been working I did previously, charters were hungry for their reward, and there was much less. Bureaucratic hoops to jump through to make this stuff happen in charter schools. Is there a role for charter schools? Should we be pursuing them as well as the ISD? And I'm not saying we don't support the ISD. We absolutely do. So, so, um, so I think the primary relationships are with the LEAs, not with ISDs, and not with PSAs. Um, it, it is true that PSAs nest under LEAs, the LEAs, 535 traditional public school districts, 300 PSAs, 835 LEAs in total. Uh, if, if I were uh, in your shoes, I would be looking to work first and foremost with uh, places that hire, um, places that hire, places that help us train or help you train um, teachers, and those are primarily not exclusively, but they are primarily um, LEAs, uh, including public school academies. But so often a public school academy sits siloed. You, you know, it's its own little entity, 200 kids, 300 kids, 400 kids, and it doesn't really have the capacity to do that. That's different from something like National Heritage Academies, for example, or New Paradigm, for example. Those are bigger operations, they're multi-school operations, and, and they, they should and often do have training programs. New Paradigm, um, a couple of years ago, we granted um, alternative certification status. Um, it would have been, I want to say, perhaps uh, spring of 21. So they're in this, this world. DPSCD is in this world. I think it really is a capacity issue. Um, if you're larger, you have a little bit more economy of scale, you can pull it off. If you're smaller, not so much. Yeah, and I know something about small. Thank you. Who's next? Um, Dr. Rose, thank you for Usually the first one like breaks open the floodgates. There we go. Thank you, Dr. Rice. That was wonderful information. Um, but so I'm an academic advisor for teacher education students at Wayne State, and my students often tell me that they knew from a very young age that they wanted to be a teacher. So you talked about starting, you know, these apprenticeships with middle schoolers, but I'm wondering what you think about what programs that start 
working with kids that are even younger that they don't know very many careers yet. Teaching is one that is very visible to them. They're probably playing school with their dolls and you know, right. doing their stuffed animals. Like what might innovation in that space look like to sort of start cultivating those kids that are already sort of inclined to wanting to be a teacher? So, so, I, so I love the question and I'm struck by, it reminds me of the question about people who are pushing three-year-old preschool as we're trying to develop four-year-old preschool in the state, as we're trying to expand four-year-old preschool in the state. We have Grow Your Own materials for students that are part of our Explore program, grades six through 12. Um, and we think this is a tremendous contribution. Um, we've got dozens of schools that are in. Uh, we'd love to see it in more schools. I've not heard too many that are looking at elementary school, but you can imagine fifth graders working with first graders, fourth graders working with kindergarten uh, students. In fact, if you look at um, small rural communities, often there'll be single school uh, districts. Uh, think about Brindley area in the in the eastern UP, you know, 500 kids or 512 kids, pre-K 12. You get kids walking down the hall and helping out their, their peers, and sometimes they're, they're little brothers and little sisters, and, and sometimes just you know younger younger kids in the community. So I think there's a real opportunity to make that happen, upper L to, to lower L. But, but I don't know of any formal program at this point, but that doesn't stop it from happening. So when you work on the creation of the very first one, at least of which I'm aware, you're going to you're going to email me and say, I told you so. Because I think it's a great idea. I know a lot of the informal takes place already, but the formal would be terrific. Yeah. Mas preguntas or questions. All right, thanks again, uh, Dr. Banks, for coming and talking to us today. Um, my question is, uh, is um, kind of a clarification question. It was your teacher preparation enrollment slide. Did that, you're talking about um, candidates enrolling in EBP programs, did that include candidates in all CERT programs as well? So let's go back to that slide. Can we go back to the, the slide with the ginormous number of numbers? Sure, just have to find my mouse. Can you find your mouse? Most people aren't trying to find their mice. So, so what, yeah, go, go, to the, go to the preceding slide. No, go back one more. Cool, thank you. That, that includes, I believe it does include all. Okay. Yes. And so my follow-up question was, when you disaggregate the data by race and ethnicity, um, can you tell us what percentages of those teachers were graduates of all cert versus traditional EPP? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, could you share that with our center? Okay. Yeah, and I, I'm just curious because I, I, I hear you and I absolutely want to see more um, diversity coming into the discussion, but I want to make sure we're doing that through a balance of the enrollment and all certain enrollment instead of just one pathway or the other. I agree. There's no question. I mean, ideally, um, ideally, uh, our, our universities could fully meet needs. Um, and that's not simply in terms of quantity and quality, but also in terms of diversity as well. The diversity should not be created out of a separate system or, or, or dependent to the base system. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I look forward to seeing that data maybe. It's like you'll have it before the end of the meeting. Right. <laughs> so much time. Okay. Who's next? Yeah, one more. The thousand question got a new Ford Explorer. That doesn't look like that's going to be in danger today. 
What about the fourth question? <laughs> what is for? No. Go ahead. I'm Lori Burgess from Cornerstone University. And my question is about um, the current slide and how you uh, consider COVID affecting these numbers. I think COVID has affected um, all education numbers and higher education numbers broadly. And so these nest under higher education numbers, they, they nest under education numbers, they nest under higher education numbers. And so they are they are um, they are adversely impacted, but perhaps somewhat less than pre-K-12 numbers, because um, if I am in college, I have a little bit better, you know, you're not teaching me to read or write or do math. Um, you're teaching me to teach reading, writing, math, and, 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 and. I have a little bit more facility to, to get on a computer, to uh, learn through a computer, um, to navigate through a... Um, so I think these are tugged down on a little bit. But there's a depressive element in these numbers. There's, there's a light tug on these numbers downward. Um, but I'm still really heartened by the fact that they went up in 2021, at least I think when they're, they're officially announced that they will in the spring, that they will show that they're up. The weirdness of these numbers is, is that they lag so substantially reality. I'm not suggesting they're inaccurate, but they just, they're, they're lagging indicators. And so we'll find out about 2122, well after 2122 is, is in the history books. So I, I do think that there's a, a, a tug on the numbers, but it hasn't been as um, as substantial as the tug in, in pre-K-12. So our chronic absenteeism rate in, in pre-K-12 doubled in uh, last year from 19% of our kids chronically absent to 38%. You don't have something that profound in higher education. I guess part of my question is um, going through COVID, and the impact on teaching as a profession looking even less appealing than its reputation before, will that impact, you know, I guess that just what I'm, would it, can we predict that fewer pre-service teachers are gonna complete? That's, that's what I'm thinking about the numbers. So, um, so I think we're gonna benefit from some helpful amnesia here. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, said famously that we have a two-week memory as a nation. And um, I think a lot of us are trying to put the, um, the pandemic in the rear view mirror and move forward. And, and if I were 20 or 21 years old, um, I'd really be wanting to do that. It's one thing when you're old and you've lived a fair bit. It's another thing when the pandemic got in the way of, of your growth and your fun and your development and 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 and, and, and I think a lot of our kids um, they they dialed it back um, during the pandemic in some cases of necessity in some cases for other reasons um, but I think we're going to see people putting their foot on on the accelerator it's going to take some time we've got to shake out of a a little bit of a a, a torpor. Um, Kind of a, a sort of a species torpor, if you will. But but I think we're doing it, and I think it'll happen in higher education as well. I think you know for a lot of our higher education institutions, it's not simply about teacher ed. It's it's about the existence of universities themselves. We've got to do better um, pre K twelve to feed you so that you can then feed us. Q, yeah. No. Went up to that explorer. So I'm wondering when we're looking at this computer's data, do you also have data that shows how many teachers are exiting the profession to give a better sense of how full the classrooms can be based on this? So, so, so Kate's got an answer. Um, I'll be sending out uh, again. Our data is a little behind. Oh, I can't even louder. Um, so 
Um, so we haven't yet seen a, a huge change, but again, our data is always about a year behind, not as bad as Title II, but a year behind. We have approximately 7 to 8% of educators who leave the classroom in terms of leaving Michigan public school teaching assignments when we're looking at RAP, the public school reporting data system. We haven't seen that dramatically change in a five year book. I'll give you the page um, when I give the link to the report. Um, it is using the most up to date data that we have published publicly is 2019, 20, 2021. Um, we did quickly look at that and we didn't see a huge change either looking at 2021 to 2122. Um, but that report's coming out this spring. Um, so we haven't seen a marked change in levers nor in, in movers. So moving between districts, um, that's around 4%. The, the, the issue of, it's easier to talk in our state and in many states about supply than demand. And, and you were talking, trying to get on the demand side. And we've got some demand side data, um, this, this, walks up to demand side data. The, the challenge though is the relationship between people who are certified and um, people who go into the profession, people who go in the profession and people who stay in the profession. Uh, we wrote to people in the midst of the pandemic, um, we welcome back to Powell, Michigan educator, we want you back. And, and so if you're certified, we invite you back and we will match make you with the school districts that are looking for staff. And if you lost your certification because you left the profession, you want to come back, but you're looking at those 150 credits and, and thinking that that's an insuperable barrier. We'll work with you in a variety of ways to bring you back. So it, sort of two welcome back proud Michigan educator efforts. Some of it was simply inviting people who had never been in the profession, right? In other words, you, you were certified, but you've never actually served as a teacher with the exception of, of student teaching. So there are a lot of different pieces. There are a lot of different leaks in the pipeline, right? I mean, I can, I can leak out of the pipeline before I actually serve as a teacher. I go through one of your programs, I pass the MTTC, I decide I'm gonna work at Chick-fil-A. I'm just saying there was a Bridge Magazine article on, on that. Sent me up the uh, sent me up the wall um, or off the cliff. Who's next? I have a similar question to the one that was asked about charter schools. Yeah. Um, we partner with a lot of private K 12 schools. And so I'm wondering if there's ever going to be room. Really in um, any of these plans for them. So we recently learned that our student teachers who would be choosing to student teach in a private school with a certified Michigan teacher wouldn't be eligible for those stipends. So it, do you ever foresee those private schools being able to be a part of all of this? So there are 148 people who vote. Um, in the state, 38 state senators, 110 um, state reps, um, and there's one governor. Uh, um, and the rest of us don't. Uh, we don't. We don't have an impact on on those those decisions, at least as directly. Um, I can't foresee what they will do. I can tell you that I think that there's a value to um, to providing those stipends. Um, two teachers uh, who, who are doing student teaching in private schools. I think that there's there's a porousness, there's a um, there's a movement between public and private. And so, if you are developing ostensibly a private school teacher now, that there's nothing that that says that that private school teacher tomorrow is going to be a public school teacher. I think it's rising tide raises all boats. I think we ought to be um, Incentivizing in that way. That's my particular 
perspective. Um, I have a different perspective about the, the scholarships or the fellowships and about the Grow Your Own programs. Those two, I think, should be the province of public schools and public schools only. But in terms of um, a student teacher stipend, um, that teacher today is student teaching in, um, in, in, a, um, in a, a parochial school or in, a, in an independent school, and tomorrow is working at the local public high school. And I don't see any, I see not only no logic to not funding that student teacher stipend, I see a lot of illogic to it. But it doesn't surprise me for the first year. Um, I think it's something that you that, that if you feel strongly about clearly you do from the question that you had a drumbeat around this theme with your um, with your state rep, with your state senator, and can work on expanding. By the way, the, the value of that is if you programs which may appear to be recurring in a budget, but which may or may not be recurring in a budget, they are more likely to continue with increased focus on these. You know, the Treasury has already gotten 2,200 plus applicants for the fellowships, 2,400 plus applicants for the, the student teacher side events. That's an enormous um, show of interest in just the first few weeks. And we're about to put out our Grow Your Own applications next week. And so there'll be more interest in, you know, in a different category, that, that middle of the three, the three buckets. We want to show continued interest, continued effectiveness of these programs so that they continue. And I think that that can include some tweaks on the margins. And that I view that as a as a as a, a small change, not a, an integral change. And there are people who, who in the in the audience may may disagree, they may argue um, that it, it's public dollars uh, for for public schools and public schools only. My argument would simply be. I think you're you're doing it for public schools because that person could end up in a public school. By the way, the people that that you're you're funding with student teacher stipends in public schools could end up in private schools tomorrow, and and you're not holding them to public schools. Um, so there's a movement back and back and forth. I think we should acknowledge that. Well, there can also be an argument for the amount of money that the private schools save the state school aid budget too, because of the, the parents choosing to send them to. Uh, it's an argument. I don't. I don't agree with it, but I, I know the argument. Yeah, I can articulate, it, but uh, you can do a better job because you 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 believe that that argument. I, I think. Look, I think educators are are in in a. Um, I think all educators have a connection with one another, irrespective of who they educate, irrespective of where they educate, irrespective of the form of education. There's a there's a there's a family there, and I think we should acknowledge that. And I think we should welcome people into the family, irrespective of how they come into the, the family. If you want to teach kids, you're one of me from my vantage point. You're part of my family, and I want to help you become strong in that profession. Yeah, you bet. Other questions, comments, concerns, fears, phobias, neuroses. This is hi. Hi. Thanks for being here. Not the best you. Um, just a, a quick clarification. So you're saying that even though legislative language for the stipend, let's say, for example, that was X, that we have the power to actually have that changed. For, well, for example, in yeah. the stipend, it says that the person has to be um, in a Michigan public school for, to do their student teaching or internship. We have candidates who actually are in Chicago public schools. But they are Michigan residents and they are enrolled at Michigan State University and they're being recommended for certification. Many of them may come back to Michigan, but they are not eligible for the study. So, and I've already checked with Treasury and it's a no, no go, but I'm just wondering if, if that if the money's there next year and we work with our legislators and that that language can be changed. Yes. So, so I, I, I just want to just a, a note on the word power. So the, the literature on power can break it up in a couple of ways. You have influence, enormous influence with us and others to get that change. I view influence as a as a as a, as a portion of power. You have no authority, but you have influence on it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. 
Who's next? No, no tomatoes on a on a Friday uh, Friday morning. Nothing. No. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for helping us help children do better in school. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bryce, for coming and talking to us today. Great. Thank you so much. Um, is uh, is this one working? It has a little red light over mute, so I don't know. It, it should be working. Okay, that's fine. Uh, it's it's if you get any comments from there, um, and here we go. Um, again, thank you uh, very much. Uh, normally, this is the time when I would you know say okay, each of our MDE people are here, but we got to do that earlier. But we do want to give a special welcome to Nadia again here for the first. Uh, piece at once you can see this photo that she's very proud of um, and <laughs> it was in the uh, uh, in our um, written updates also uh, and you can see she's been uh, an educator for over 20 years uh, and with a family of educators she is now our our uh, professional practices uh, guru all right so that mde professional practice at michigan.gov email Still use it, still use that. But but yes, uh, Nadia will be getting will be getting those. Uh, so again, a big big welcome. We are so happy to have her on the team, um, and uh, it, it, we're happy to have her. But it's unfortunate that sometimes we have to have that right because what she's dealing with are mm, professional practice things that mm, we prefer didn't happen. But we live in a real world. So, um, uh, the quarterly reminder to read your written updates. Uh, one of these days, we'll put a quiz in it, and there'll be a door prize uh, for you. I won't say whether there is one in this one or not. Um, a quick legislative update. We are in lame duck, um, and there's a minimal number of scheduled sessions for uh, the House and the Senate. There is not expected to be any action on uh, education bills. So. Um, the, there was a dyslexia package uh, out there. Uh, there were some reciprocity bills uh, out there that uh, our department supported. Um, and they're likely to just not go anywhere um, in, in the, these dwindling session days uh, that are left. Um, so any bills that are uh, introduced but don't pass will have to be reintroduced with new bill numbers after the new year. So basic civics on that. The, um, uh, so the, the reciprocity bills, if you, you see the bill numbers and such uh, in the various quarterly updates, uh, we didn't put the bill numbers up here because if they're not gonna pass and they're gonna get new numbers uh, when they get reintroduced. Ed McBroom uh, was from Vulcan uh, in, in the UP was the chief sponsor of the reciprocity uh, bill for, for teacher certification. Uh, he, he continues in, in the Senate, uh, so his, his term limits have not uh, expired. And so uh, we would expect that these bills uh, would come back. Okay. Um, a big thing, uh, the we have a waiver on a 90-day limitation for daily substitute permit placements. Um, and, you know, we have our full year basic permit, which is good for a year, you can be placed in, uh, you know, in anywhere that you have a background or a uh, past uh, MTTC. And then we have this daily substitute permit, which is good also for a year, but uh, it, it, for placements of no longer than 90 days, uh, 90 calendar days. Um, and it's meant for intermittent uh, placements. It's not meant to be a long-term sub uh, uh, fix. Uh, it's supposed to be able to bridge, gap, bridge gaps. It's intended for sporadic kinds of assignments. So uh, say a building has a, a, a rotating sub who goes from, from classroom to classroom here and there for a day or two days. Um, the, uh, uh, the, we, then with this, this with the daily sub uh, permit, if a uh, school needed to place somebody for more than 90 days, they have had to apply for an extension. And then if they still need them after that additional 90 days, they have to apply for an emergency extension. 
both of which are approved by the superintendent. Um, the season for requesting extensions uh, is, is upon us. It actually started earlier in November. Um, and we were in lieu of the legislature passing a bill that says nobody needs a permit for anything and you can sub, right? They, cause they did do that last year. Um, we uh, solicited a waiver request from all the ISDs, every ISD in the state submitted a waiver request um, to waive this 90 day limitation for the, the remainder of this school year so that individuals who are on daily sub permits can continue to stay in their positions, not pose a disruption to kids. We know some districts will put, let's take three uh, subs, put them on daily sub permits, and one is in classroom A, one's in classroom B, and one's in classroom C. And then after 90 days, they musical chairs, and then 90 days, and then they musical, do musical chairs again, and then the school year's over. And uh, there they went. And those kids have in those classrooms have had the disruption of a new teacher every 90 days. Um, and that's not what we want. So this uh, waiver, again, good for just this academic year to allow that 90 day permit uh, uh, for placements beyond, uh, beyond that uh, to help our districts with this, which may impact some of your uh, graduates, for sure, may impact some of your in-stream candidates, particularly those serving in long-term sub-positions or in, uh, uh, you know, during their, their student teaching, for example. Um, so just as an FYI. Uh, okay, so um, we're talking a little bit about the Grow Your Own Grants, uh, both phase one and a little bit about phase two. Uh, for phase one, uh, we had a million dollar budget. We got seven million dollars in requests. So, ha -ha. <laughs> you know, who knew people wanted money for this? Well, we did, and that's why we asked for a lot. Um, and uh, we got we had that million. Um, we 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 took in applications. It was a very short window. Um, got approvals out in June. Got the funds uh, expired on uh, on uh, eight thirty, so you couldn't. It's a very small window, so that resulted in us needing to to prioritize candidates. So, um, what what were who was funded in that first round? Were people who were in programs uh, that had completed fifty percent or more? So it was like have an immediate impact. You know, get people right across the line as well as candidates who were in high needs fields, uh, which were called out in the application, uh, ESL, bilingual education and special education. So we go to the next slide. Um, we had 158 teachers uh, who were funded. Uh, they represent 107 different LEAs, PSAs and ISDs. Uh, you can see the, the population breakdown. Uh, again, those three percentages, paras, substitutes, and then certified teachers seeking additional endorsements don't add up to 100%, uh, because in some cases, the school said this is an employee, but didn't tell us exactly what their role was in, in the school. Like They didn't say it was uh, uh, other support personnel. Uh, that, that one got popped up. And then there were some that were student teachers that were being, uh, that were being hired. Um, but you can see, what, you know, basic some of the three bigger, biggest categories that we had good data on. Uh, it was 27 different educator preparation providers. Um, I was uh, the next statistic. Uh, I think is rather remarkable. 20, uh, 85 percent were traditional comprehensive educator preparation institution uh, programs, uh, the programs that that you offer, um, and only 15 percent were alternative route providers. Um, when I was going, when, when I was in the process of reviewing, it seemed like, gosh, there's a lot of alternative route monies in here. Um, but as it happened, no, it was actually a very, it was a small percentage of, of the overall awardees. Um, and and if, it was always good to reiterate, none of this money went to out-of-state institutions. None of this money went to places that are not Michigan-approved educator preparation providers. So you are the community um, that, that got the fiscal benefit uh, of this. 
Uh, there were people who applied for Western Governors or University of Phoenix or Grand Canyon. They were all flatly denied. Um, so it was our community. Um, the averaging funding request was about 6,000. We had allocated uh, 10,000 as a cap, um, but we got a lot of requests that were lower than that. So we were able to fund more teachers than we had originally thought we would be able to fund with, uh, with that. Go to the next slide. So phase uh, two here, 175 plus million, it's about 176, um, give or take 500,000, um, because also embedded in this are the Explore grants. The two basic grants available, one for people going through alternative routes and one for those in degree granting programs, to unpack some of that at our last DARTEP meeting. In case you missed it, this is a fantastic webinar, that, that link. Uh, I, believe the QR code takes you to the, if it doesn't take you to the video, uh, it'll take you to the page where there's a link to the video. Um, uh, Holly and Gina did a terrific job uh, unpacking the, the Grow Your Own grant um, process, the, the core of the application. Primary audience was our K-12 uh, partners who uh, will be the ones doing the applications. Um, but we had representation from, from EPPs also. Um, and uh, I think it's our most, uh, I was just doing a little look at different YouTube uh, things that we've posted. I think it's one of our most watched uh, uh, from our, uh, our unit, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, as noted, a partnership agreement is with an EPP is is absolutely required in both of these uh, these grants. Um, and we have two additional webinars coming up: uh, application technical assistance on December sixteenth to unpack the the process of the application, and then uh, a, a partnership connection webinar, our matchmaking session. We had one this week. Thank you to all the EPPs who were able to. Uh, to attend, I understand we, you know, the, there was uh, an imbalance uh, in in audiences um, of of some significance, um, and uh, we actually were worried it would be the other way around that we would have, you know, twenty or thirty school districts and two or three EPPs. So uh, we Gina did a tremendous due diligence to like come on out, come in here. Let's make sure you're here. Let's 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 get you signed up. Um, and uh, and uh, then on the other side, which we also reached out to, um, didn't have as much. What I'm hoping is when the application opens next week, that districts will hit that partnership agreement thing, and then it becomes real. Oh, I have to do this. I just thought I gave you some names. <laughs> um, and uh, that will spur some people to more uh, joining for that that partnership connection webinar. So even though it wasn't as as well attended, please come back to the next one um, so that we can we can do this and we can keep doing it in the future as these monies become recurring things. Coming soon is a troop to teachers grant. We were allocated fifteen million dollars uh, to districts to pay salaries for qualified veterans. For up to two semesters of student teaching, uh, or it's called, it says mentorship experience in the, in the law, but it's, it's the student teaching, um, and up to two years of service afterward. We're not sure how much traction this one is going to get, because a qualified veteran has to already have a bachelor's degree, so not somebody who's in stream and is now at the point of student teaching, but somebody who already has a bachelor's degree. Um, and is ready to student teach. So you, you may have some people like in, in this situation. Um, perhaps our residency programs and alternative route programs are, are, are going to get some of the, the, the greater traction, some of our post back programs. Um, but that application will be coming soon um, so that we can, we can spend this money. Uh, the legislatures are eager to see it go through. This is totally unrelated to what we what was called troops to teachers in the past. Um, those who remember Eddie Jones uh, from our team um, administered that. That was a federally run program to support 
and provide technical assistance to in-service uh, uh, service people um, and veterans um, to kind of hook them up to programs that would take their GI benefits um, and, and then get them to certification. Um, the legislature decided to still call it troops and teachers, even though it's, <laughs> this is a different thing. It doesn't do all of that other stuff that that one did. So that's a coming soon. All right, go to the next slide. All right, uh, a rostering change. Uh, thank you uh, for your quick and, and early submissions of rosters to help us with treasury um, and uh, get some extra an extra layer of verification for uh, people who were in student teaching placements. You heard Dr. Rice give the, the statistics today about the volume of applications that have been received uh, by the Department of Treasury. Um, and that, that is as of Monday uh, this week. Um, and uh, we will be doing the, this next round of rosters for student teaching uh, for the purpose of the stipend faster than we did the, the last one. So that's coming out this month so that we can get that data to uh, Treasury in January. And so that those individuals who are student teaching in, uh, in the winter term will be able to get access to their money faster. But one big change, instead of the student numbers, which we get, the, which you give us, we are going to need to collect the UICs for these individuals. That's a unique identification code. You may say, what is that? <laughs> you may say, we don't have that. Well, your institution does. Every, every student enrolled in Michigan schools, period. Yes, Kate, from? Anybody reported in a Michigan, uh, state of Michigan data system that goes to SEPI, so star is the post-secondary one with yep. the UIC. It starts, you know, in the K-12 and it follows them in post-secondary. So if your IMG or your provider tells you that you don't have one, they need to register that in the state of Michigan and then on day two. Yeah, I'm going to repeat that. Yeah. So uh, as Kate was saying, uh, the, anybody who is, is reported through any of the statewide systems uh, like STAR has a, a UIC. Um, it is, uh, I, when I was a dean, I didn't know what that was. I didn't see that. I knew student numbers uh, and that's it because it was our registrar and financial aid that had access to, to the UICs. So it'll take some collaboration with uh, with those divisions in your university to um, to get that 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 information and uh, and Kate said that if if for some reason they don't have one there's a process to get them one through reporting in uh, the star system. Will yeah. They, will they have one if they did not attend a, a Michigan school? So like we have a lot of students that come from out of state. Yeah, okay, Lisa's asking if they'll have one if they came from an out-of-state school. Um, and, and they believe yes, because it, yes, the enrollment, yeah, because, so, right. Yeah, they'll have one because the university assigns, the re university reports them in the STAR system. So if they didn't have a UIC coming into the university, uh, once they are reported, through STAR, then they, then they do get one. So um, there we go. That's gonna facilitate the data sharing agreements between Treasury and, and, uh, and us, uh, because we have to make sure what, that, that people aren't concurrently receiving different streams of money. And so it's gonna be shared back and forth between us and, and uh, Treasury. So we, we need to make sure we're in compliance with the law and that things move smoothly. Kate, if you want to come up to the mic, or I can. Uh, okay. Kate is coming to the mic for those online to give you a bonus. <laughs> it's a data bonus, so take it for what you will. Um, but we have been talking a lot with the data accountability systems of the difficulty in connecting the data you have, especially with surveys, to the employment data that we provide back to you guys. The nice thing about getting the UIC is because it is a state identifier. We've been working with CEPI to create a crosswalk between the UIC and the PIC, which is 
the counterpart in the employment system. So we're hoping, Doug look excited about this. Um, we are hoping that this is something in the next year where we'll be able to actually get you much better data in terms of you being much more able to link the data all together for usability. So that's exciting. Um, so we really need the UIC. <laughs> Now, there you go. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Um, last time uh, at DARTEP, I issued a call to uh, call to action um, and announced we'd be giving a survey on innovative practices. Um, in, in the mean, in, since since then, uh, Dr. Rice uh, has published a letter uh, call to action to all uh, educator preparation institutions. Uh, to engage in innovation and help us spread the word about the innovations that are in play so that we can do this kind of matchmaking between uh, school districts and educator preparation providers. Um, and that was uh, that was shared with deans. Uh, it is published on our website. The link to it is in the written updates um, and your deans may have shared it back with you. Uh, and, and if not, it's there, it's public, you can, you can see the letter. Um, and, and as you heard Dr. Rice say today, we're, we're absolutely serious about this. Um, it, it, we don't want to open a moratorium um, and, and it's like grow new providers, especially when we have providers who are struggling uh, to stay afloat. Uh, and we want to use the wisdom of the field that we have, the vetted uh, programs that we have. Um, some things that you do, you may not think are innovative, but they are. So things that are like fully online programs, hybrid programs, right? Uh, I, I know some institutions have embraced that. Others have not embraced it. Um, and in some institutions, it's such a matter of routine that it doesn't seem innovative anymore. But truly, when a, when a candidate calls our office and says, I want to become an English teacher and I need a program that's 100% online, um, can you help me find a place to become an English teacher? Um, right now, we have to say, mm, here's a couple of alt routes that I know are 100% online, and we have... Uh, a directory of all these other providers, but uh, you'll have to call them and find out if you can do this online. Um, so we we want to we want to be able to provide that good customer service, provide that matchmaking, to defuse the argument of there's nobody near me that I can go to to become a teacher, um, or there's nobody near me that I can grow the staff in my school to become teachers. Um, we're looking for competency-based programs. The superintendent received a, uh, a, a hello, how are you? I have an idea email from uh, a school board member, uh, not state school board, but a local school board member saying, gosh, Western governors is really cool. The model that they have and other states are doing this thing. Can Michigan do that? And, and the answer is absolutely Michigan can do that. We can't make you do that. <laughs> um, it is an institutional decision. Um, we don't have a state-run system. You are all constitutionally autonomous entities uh, and, and can choose to innovate uh, or not. Um, and there are, I know, higher learning commission implications for a lot of, a lot of innovations, but there's nothing regulatory from our end that, that stops it. So an, a fully online competency-based program, a place-based program, a residency program, consortia programs, so all things are uh, we know are in place in some schools uh, and uh, could be expanded upon. Um, and you heard a bit about registered apprenticeships. Uh, when I went into the survey data earlier this week, there were just a handful of, of responses. So I sent out a, hey, if we can all respond by DARTEP, uh, that'd be great. And I immediately got like, they started rolling in and I haven't gone in today to look at the data to see um, how many are in there, but I will thank you for doing it if, you have, if your institution has not responded and we look for one response per institution just to make it easier to, uh, to um, digest. Um, 
please, it's still open. Uh, you know, the survey didn't have a, a, a shutdown date. Yeah, Gail. Did it? That QR code should take you right to that survey. Oh, the slides will be up sometime this weekend on the Dietech site. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, we can get, yeah, we can get you that link. I don't know, Darcy, if you've got it, you, you can pull it, pull it up handy and just <laughs> type it right into Gail's computer uh, there. One of the things that we're very concerned about is barriers also. Uh, and and um, it's something we'd like to, to have conversation about um, because there's, that's the last question is what barriers have you encountered to being able to implement uh, innovative programs? There are ones that we know of. There are some that are, are regulatory, uh, but there are others that we don't know about. Um, I will say that I did read one response, an institution will not be named, um, that their response was one sentence. We do not have innovative programs. It may be very sad <laughs> um, because the potential uh is 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 there um for for this um some of the barriers that were identified in the the small set that we had were we need time and people to to develop and implement right um we we we're, we want to do this these are the things that we're exploring but you know it 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 takes us time uh, it takes us that we we need people to do it, and I get it. That that is uh, that's for real. Um, but yeah. This firm should start only, correct? Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, we look. We'll, we'll be interested in in additional endorsement pieces because we get as many. Uh, so the question was, is this just for in, initial certification? And and yeah, that is like where the. The, the 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 focus is right in growing the teacher workforce, but um, we we get as many inquiries about uh, additional endorsements uh, as as we do about initial teaching certificates. Like I need, I want to become an ESL teacher. What do I do? I want to you know want to want to migrate to special education. What do I do? Um, and so we want to be able to feature uh, as many things as we can. As the, and as 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 diverse an array uh, as we can. So um, one thing you heard, Dr. Rice. Uh, well, there was a, a slide that he didn't get to. <laughs> um, that you'll see when you see the slide deck. Uh, we are going to be having a series of um, presentations at state board meetings uh, featuring your programs. Um, and so we've got the first lined up um, for December. So in just under two weeks. Um, featuring Northern Michigan University and Saginaw State University. Our consultants are reaching out to um, uh, multiple universities and colleges for subsequent board meetings to, to line up. Um, these are uh, intended to help our board see that actually higher ed is cooperating with PK-12 and operating across the state and 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 busting myths about um, the state of educator preparation um, and giving it this high level soapbox, uh, not to advertise individual programs, but to spotlight the possibilities uh, for programming. So we're gonna keep an eye out for these things. All right, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, visual art and music education standards. Uh, Gina will be our lead uh, for this. The work will begin in early uh, summer of 23. Uh, we will need uh, faculty and program coordinators for this. We're going to need cooperating teachers, you know, skilled individuals. So keep an eye out for solicitations from Gina or just drop her a line um, because we want to build, uh, as always, a, 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 a representative um, the committee for for that work. Uh, math and reading specialist standards uh, development is, is currently on pause. Uh, we we thank those that we had solicited and who said, "I want to be a part of this," and we would start 
building some teams uh, for it. Uh, this is this is it's currently on pause. It will happen, um, and because there's been there's, since the day I started that the department people have been asking me, when are you going to redo reading specialist standards? And that's been eight years. Um, and we it's on pause pending some other MDE wide initiatives in literacy and numeracy. Um, the like the details of those aren't public, so there but there are big overall department level initiatives and focus coming in on literacy and numeracy. And so we don't want the specialist roles to be out of step with the vision of uh, our colleagues across the department. And so once that vision is moving forward, then we can connect uh, in, in with the specialist because you know, we're not gonna go back and redo our other uh, uh, other standards in preparation for teachers of math and English language arts and literacy. Those are set. You're implementing them. Keep doing so. Um, but the uh, specialists will do that. Um, Darcy is uh, spearheading uh, supports for science program revisions. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunities to, uh, to engage with this work uh, with her. Um, and it really, there's a big action item at the bottom, names and emails of science education instructors and science instructors. Um, and she's building the network of science educators. I will say there is also a cross office uh, MDE wide visioning going on about effective science education. Um, and, and this work is, you know, works, works with this. Uh, she works with the Michigan Science Education Leaders Association on these various networking opportunities um, to do this. Also, the Michigan Mathematics and Science Leadership Network and MSTA. Um, so they're going to do a one-day symposium in, in March on this. Um, well, were you saying uh, that it was uh, your group was sort of heavy in one area rather than another? No, just the, the people you've been collaborating with to help support this, yeah. Yes, yes. We have a baseball Yeah. Yeah, Darcy's mentioning they have more K-12 folks uh, working in, in this uh, support work than we had higher ed folks, and we'd like to see a balance in there uh, because all those voices are important. Thank you to those who, who are. Marsha <laughs> and Gail and, and others, yes. Um, but it, it, yes, your names come up more and I, <laughs> when I see things. So um, so there we go. And so you can reach out to, to, to Darcy for that. Um, all right. So the thing that we previewed and wanting to talk about last time and want to talk about here um, is professional practices. So we're intending to develop some EPP specific technical assistance around criminal convictions, disclosure expectations, best practices, all of these things. And we need to know what your questions are and what would you like to see in that? And so what we can do right now is throw some things out. If there's things in the chat that come through on this, uh, Nadia and Kate are, are taking notes. I know that this can this also can carry into job alike. And so we we'll wanna make sure anything in job alike, but talking about professional practices and, and these things, what I, I know some of the questions are that come up. They're often very individually case based, right? I have this person who X, Y, and Z. What can I do with them? Which we bring to Kate. So Kate, come on up. Okay. Um, so the impetus for this as well, especially now that we finally have Nadia in place because uh, it's been a long time since we've had a professional practices consultant, but we have had a lot of situations come up in the last uh, two years that have just really called to light the need to make sure we're all in a common space in terms of understanding of our roles and responsibilities around background checks 
disclosures where MBE's authority lies, because as a state compared to other um, states nationally, we are very constrained with our authority over school safety from an educator standpoint. Um, so it is something that we really want to make sure we open up a dialogue with all of our providers to be thinking about what are best practices that you may have and implement as, as policies when you are considering candidates and getting ready to recommend. Um, because you are kind of our first line of defense. Uh, individuals only need to disclose convictions to us. So we have an incident right now where somebody is pending they have charges, the conviction is pending, and it's a very serious offense that would be a listed offense, which is one that precludes employment in any capacity because it is of a sexual offense. Um, so it is very serious. And if the person came through for our application, they don't need to disclose anything to us legally. We would recommend them if you recommend them, provided they pass their MTTC and such. Um, so it is something to really be thinking about in terms of what, what roles and responsibilities your team feels you have in, in thinking about disclosures and processes around that. Just trying to give you a lot more thinking space since we randomly asked two questions of you <laughs> in this presentation. Yeah, well, honestly, my my first question because I've I've only been in this role for about a year and a half, two years, and I sort of took over for somebody who'd already built our processes for this. Mm -hmm. um, do you have it? Does the, the MDE have? Sorry, does the MDE have a standardized form for conviction disclosures? that we can uh, provide to our candidates. And right now, SAU does that on a regular basis. We do it in every methods course. So they see the form over and over again and say, you know what, it's because situations and circumstances can change. So we, and we gather those, we put them in a permanent student record. Um, but my, my fear is I've noticed that our form doesn't necessarily exactly match the questions that our candidates are answering in their MOAS application. So I, I, I am not sure at this point, are we asking too many questions? Does, does, the, does, the, does the MBE have standard questions that we must ask? Is there some way that we can get a, a universal form that every university uses? Um, I guess that, that would be my, my first question. Yeah, great questions. Um, we do have a form. So uh, in legislation, school districts and school employees are responsible for disclosure of both charges and convictions of offenses that we term enumerated offenses. So there's a specific section of law um, that basically details out or enumerates the offenses for which we may take action. And it is expected that any school employee must disclose both being charged with any of those offenses as well as convicted of those offenses within like three days, business days of the offense. So we have a form that we have up on our website. I can send out another email that gives you guys the link to our main site. It also has a nice breakdown in less legalese of what enumerated offenses are and such, and the forms are available there. So you may certainly start distributing those so that way they see them because it's what the districts are expected to be using with their, with their um, employees. Uh, but it does, getting to your point about the application, the application is much more generic and a little broader as well. So we can also send you a screenshot of the questions, but it's essentially, have you been convicted of any misdemeanor or felony? Um, have you any actions currently pending or have been taken on your credential or any other credential from another state? Um, and I believe there's one more piece. Um, but that is more because people have a very difficult time unpacking what an enumerated offense is, and then they run into risk of non-disclosure, for which then we have to do an investigation. So we just say, tell us what misdemeanors and felonies you have, and we'll tell you all felonies are enumerated, but there's some misdemeanors that are and are not. So we kind of help quickly parse it out. If it's non-enumerated, we, we clear it very quickly. Um, if it's enumerated, then we have, we have processes detailed that we have to follow. How often as an EPP should we be collecting this from students? Should we be doing it on a semester basis, once at the beginning and end of the program? What is your suggestion? So I think it's an institutional decision, but we recommend to school districts that they get the disclosures to their staff at the beginning of every year at a minimum. 
um, because especially the summer is when we see a lot of incidents occur. Um, so we, we do um, advocate that you work with your students to do it at least at the start of each academic year. You, you can do it more than that, especially if they're, you know, their placement may be happening in the middle of, of the school year. Um, some of the placements may require the background as well. So it can be good just to be ahead of it because schools can have additional policies about what they may um, decide to not take on candidates or employees for. So we serve as kind of that minimum bar and then districts can add on to it in terms of their own policies. Mm -hmm. I have another question, Mike. It's a question that probably will go after our last meeting. And the convictions, yes, we always collect. We have been collecting information on charges and they had doubts whether we could or should do it. Yeah, that's one you should definitely talk to your legal teams about, you know, make sure you're in compliance. But when it is self-disclosure, that is, you know, okay. Um, it is, you know, if you're running background checks with them, you should be able to see charges in the background checks, um, as well as the convictions. At least that's, you know, what our school districts and such would see as well. Um, so it can be even from that schools will hold on employment until they see where the charges are going. Um, so it would be worth talking to your legal team about, um, or, and at least making it very clear to candidates what may impact, you know, their future careers. Are you the contact that students have questions? The MDE professional practice email is, and then it's a team of us that all manage it. So usually me, hopefully soon Nadia will take over the email. Thank you. <clears throat> last our tech meeting, uh, when the deans met, uh, we talked about maybe broadening the question on what type of certificate. And when I'm looking at our questions, I noticed that uh, we asked, "Have you ever had any, or have you ever had a teaching certificate revoked?" And I think that was an example that was given that someone had a different certificate. So therefore we're potentially rewording it to if you had any type of certificate, including a teaching certificate, revoked to get around that. Yeah, that's a great point. So we did have an incident where somebody had a, a different license um, revoked. I believe it was a medical license revoked. Um, MDE's authority is we can't take that into account. We are able in law to only take into account educator credentialing from other states. Um, but you are more than welcome to expand yours to consider those types of things. We're also seeking some legislative changes to try and improve upon um, the way that the conviction legislation is currently written to expand it because it's extremely out of date. Um, but yeah, you are welcome to expand and take into account other things, provided you've met with your legal and your teams and ensured it's aligned. It especially behooves you to do it proactively so the policies are in place prior to situations occurring where now you have to retroactively think about these situations and might have to let that individual through um, because it wasn't already established. So this from this is a question from online. What is the MBE's position on situations where students were charged with an offense that successfully completed a deferral program, for example, MIP, controlled, su controlled substance possessions slash use, DV, that resulted in the adjudication being made non-public and not considered a, quote, conviction, unquote. Yeah, so when it is uh, deferred and then it is the deferral program is successfully completed in the eyes of the law, they no longer hold that conviction from our standpoint. So they would not be held, um, they would not be seen as holding an enumerated or non-enumerated offense. Um, MIPs, DUIs that are first and second offense, things like that tend to not be enumerated. They still can be misdemeanors and should be reported. Um, so they don't fall into non-disclosure because some DUIs, the third offense and on, are felonies. 
Um, but yeah, we do fall into individuals not reporting, especially MIPs and things because they're like, oh, I just paid a fine, but it was still a misdemeanor. And then they're having to talk to us about why they failed to disclose something um, in the first place. Lucas, you had a question. I got a thank you back for the answer. Anytime. One question that we always had um, was what documents specifically do you need? Sometimes we'll get something that isn't a judgment or sentence, but not a register of action. There's information on people that yeah. would like what specifically are you looking for? And then my second part is I know recoding the is a very big ask. Nope, that's a no. Is there any <laughs> way that we could like have it upload? Where we like We're working on it. Um, no, well, okay. it's a no now. <laughs> um, so, in terms of documents, our ideal world, what we will always ask for is official court documents, um, as well as the description of circumstance in their own words, which ideally is not, I didn't mean to, it wasn't my fault type of thing. So I get a lot of those, but a true, here's what happened type thing, not explaining it away, but here is the circumstance surrounding it. Um, it really helps us because sometimes there are situations we had an individual that had a uh, provision of alcohol to underage individuals. It's an enumerated offense. It can fall into a grooming type of situation. Once we were able to meet with him and discuss the description of circumstances and such, he was 21, went on a weekend holiday party and was drinking and there were underage drinkers present that were 19. So sometimes it's those circumstances that you unpack it where it's like, okay, we can put forward a conditional agreement. Um, which is we'll let you keep your cert for now, but you're kind of on a probation status. We're going to watch you don't have any further convictions for X amount of time versus we're going to suspend or deny your certificate. So that description really helps us understand the full circumstances around it. The court documents, our ideal world is a register of action. It very clearly delineates what the offense was and such, um, but those aren't always viable for individuals. The courts should be able to get them the appropriate documents. Screenshots that don't include the full document, we won't take. We get a lot of crap things and then we're not able to tell if it's an actual official document. So the register of actions is most ideal, but when we ask for it, we give a big list of the things that we, we will take. I don't know if that helps. And then document upload, we are working actually on a complete redesign of both the employment data system as well as the certification system. We got a grant to merge them together, um, that is a big lift and a long process. But part of that will be that individuals are just handling the self-disclosure themselves with document uploads and things of that nature. So that will be coming um, just in like three years. <laughs> we move so fast, I know. Well, uh, regarding the court documents, we're, we are very candidates that courts are in the process of transitioning documents um, from their archives to some sort of digital format, and they're experiencing long delays. Um, I, some candidates say, oh, the courts can't find it. So I, I go to that, well, I need a letter from the court then that says that. that, that I, mean, I don't know what is the recourse when they come back and say, there is no document. They can't find the document. They don't have it. If they can't find the document, we do then require that the courts provide us that because it then comes to us. If anything were to happen and we were found in violation, it comes down to us um, having to answer, uh, well, to constituents as well as the governor, why we would have issued something out of compliance of law, especially because the offenses that are enumerated are extremely serious offenses. Um, so if it, it does happen where courts aren't able, especially for older offenses, um, but then we just require, we need the state, like on that letterhead from that court, the official documentation that says they're not able to provide the documents. Um, and then we'll work with them depending on the situation and what the offense is on how we can try and find something for them. We are hoping, you know, as Nadia gets caught, caught up to speed in the coming months to hold, hopefully, you know, some open office hour discussions to see where people are at. We can also try and, you know, block some time at coming DARTEBS um, to continue this discussion. But 
If you do have any questions or thoughts or concerns, please do email at that MD professional practice inbox. It's a team one. And so it'll then quickly go to Nadia and myself and some other team members for us to try and make sure we give you timely responses. And we're thinking about it holistically for all providers as well. So yeah, any other questions? Thank you. All right. Thank you, thank you. Um, our, as we always remind, follow us on social media uh, at Michigan Educator across those three platforms and use that hashtag proud Michigan Educator or hashtag PME to promote the exciting things that are happening with your candidates and your graduates uh, and subscribe to our Educationally Speaking newsletter, uh, again, which comes out once a month right around the middle. Um, some open Q&A time. Um, I think we're until uh, 145, yes, in this, in this session, so about eight minutes. Um, I did pose the question about barriers to innovation. Uh, if you want to share some things now sort of outside of the survey or just other questions. Right here. Um, so at Eastern, we have a um, program um, with the WISD. Yes. Yes. So um, is there any talk of the state of making it so special ed can be special ed only certification as a standard? Or did you hear Gina uh, laugh there just a moment ago? <laughs> a lot of people She's not laughing at you and the, at the idea at all. Uh, she's laughing with recognition because yes, this is a conversation and the mic is coming her way. Or you can come up here. So, well, maybe offline people can. Um, so what's gonna happen, uh, we have, there's been a task force working on um, looking at special ed certification requirements uh, as well as other special ed pieces. Um, we should be hearing some information about that. I, I can't tell you when, but soon. And hopefully in the next few months, um, there'll be something that comes out from those task forces and uh, task force processes. Um, they're engaging a lot of stakeholders all over the state to really try to figure out these tricky special ed questions. So stay tuned. News is coming. We would, we would love for experimental programs to be regular programs. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You know? Um, I have my question is about the MTQC. Uh -huh. do, we, um, do we know what the cost is going to be for the new secondary ed um, hmm. certifications? Yeah, they're, they're, single, uh, they're single tests rather than the, the multi subject. Uh, Subtest models, so they should be consistent with the cost of a current of a current test. So, what what your English test costs now, your seven twelve ELA test will cost uh, at that point. Um, the one wrinkle is we will be adding that professional knowledge and skills piece. Again, it'll be it's it's subtest size, so it's in that fifty nine sixty nine dollar range rather than the one thirty nine, so or one twenty nine one twenty nine. And then provided when we do the RFP, uh, the vendor doesn't come back and say, we can do all of this if all tests cost, you know, something else. <laughs> Sean, in the update, it says that preliminary feedback for the applications that were turned in November is going to be available to August. Is that correct? Or is that a typo? <laughs> that may be a typo. Who wrote that? I'm looking around at the team. <laughs> Darcy is uh, uh, has uh, her her yeah so yeah that ought to be that'd be a typo yes yeah March. August is like the April. For April window, getting in August, yeah. Yeah. It's live. <laughs> it went out Monday. Uh, but yes, we can, you know, we can 
you, you hear it, that's fine. Um, I guess I will lower my my charge for independent proofreading. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, you got the prize. So um, yeah, yeah, Ford Escort, which means we'll take you to a Ford plant and we'll escort you around. Um, and there you are. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, maybe people already know. Oh, Paul's got something, yes. Paraxis has been discussed previously, but when, when the pandemic began, we had the executive order for what, like a temporary certificate for those that didn't have the yes. CPC. I just like, was, I didn't look at, was there any, anything that could inform, was, was that a good decision? Um, did, was there like conversions from the temporary to the standard um, with, the, with people successfully later uh, passing the exam? That is a good question. I only dug into the data on that, um, on, on percentage of people who converted from that temporary one year through to standard. Um, I know, I know that it did. Def so I can I can think of individual cases where, um, as it was coming, that one year was coming to expire, there was a panic. Um, because they either hadn't hadn't attempted the test yet, or hadn't hadn't passed. Um, uh, but I don't know how widespread uh, panic that was. I know that in, for a while it seemed like it wasn't converting very fast because people had a, had a certificate, they got a job, it was great. Um, but um, yeah, we can look at that because we've got we've got all the the names and uh, picks of all of those individuals um, and see. That's a good question. And uh, what we what we do deal with now are some of the people who say. Oh, it was closed for a year, and I couldn't take my test, and all of this, and 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 Bridget um, gives them a good death stare through through email, because uh, <laughs> she knows exactly how long tests were, uh, centers were closed, and uh, at limited capacity, and uh, the efforts that we had to we we undertook to increase the capacity of, of the, the thing. So. All right, I think we're good. Thank you. I didn't know I was gonna have to do this when I agreed to take notes, but um, okay. We are from the accreditation group. So we talked about some of the new things going on with CAPE, the training, the messaging for the team seems to be working and for the most part going more smoothly. Um, then we discussed AQEP, and CAPE and virtual versus in-person visits as well as conferences. So there's positives and negatives about that. Uh, there are currently three pilots using AQEP in the state of Michigan. Um, and then we looked at, oh, the patterns of stipulations and AFIs um, that CAPE has, usually presents. I believe that's going to be available in February. I think that's what they said. So you'll see where most of the stipulations and AFIs fall for the uh, EPPs in Michigan. Um, then we started talking about a new focus that CAPE seems to be having on those problematic areas. And that is for your mentor teacher evaluations. That just seems to be an area they're really focusing on now. So be forewarned. Um, also, we're looking at, we, we talked about measuring criteria and aligning it with more than one outcome that can get muddled. And finally, we talked about the disposition rubrics that we all have and 
looking at how we're changing criteria, making, uh, removing the word exceeds from the rubrics. And there was just a lot of discussion about the dispositions. And finally, a book was recommended um, called The Art of Possibility by Rosamond Zo a Stone Zinnender. So if you're interested in uh, reading a book about the possibility of failures, that's the book you wanna read. Well, we um, had quite a bit of conversation. We started off talking about uh, sketches and um, the possibility of districts that won't issue sketches for cooperating teachers. Are they being directed back to us? Um, different institutions talked about whether they were or were not a sketch provider. Um, uh, GVSU talked about uh, a problem that they discovered where some mentor teachers were um, either in error or trying to receive double credit for sketches from the institution, the EPP, as well as from the district. So they have developed a verification form that was shared out to us. Um, let's see. And then there was discussion about how many sketches to offer the cooperating teachers uh, for the apprenticeship clinical experience type mentors versus internship uh, student teaching mentors. Uh, we also raised some questions about MTTC prep, um, especially for the new grade bands. Um, MDE confirmed that the questions are more directly aligned to the teacher prep standards for the grade band. So there's much more direct alignment that way. Um, lower, and element, lower and upper elementary practice tests are more robust. Um, and then the practice tests, when the candidates take them, um, they give rationale for why an answer, what is the correct answer or why an answer is an incorrect answer. So it's a little bit more formative uh, feedback for the candidates. Let's see, we discussed um, candidates from uh, teacher candidates that have no connection to said you know EPP program coming and saying, hey, I, for example, went through Western Governors and I'm failing my test over and over again. I want some help prepping with for that. And what is the onus for EPPs to provide that prep? Because these are candidates that, that did not go through our programs. Um, Oakland raised that question. You know, they have their free materials out on the website. So because they're, you know, free out there providing those, but usually that to an extent and where there have been some teacher candidates that were very um, insistent about the fact that Oakland should give them test prep help. Um, even though this candidate did not go through Oakland's program, um, how and how we as EPPs deal with that. Let's see, we had raised some concerns about our COVID group of teacher candidates coming through and their lack of skills, their trends in passing or not, the MTTCs, their lack of professional behaviors, and, and how we are addressing those within our EPPs. Um, let's see, we had some, uh, just a general question about uh, GPA requirements for G, um, EPPs, uh, discovered MDE does not have a specific GPA requirement that's usually that's something that's determined by the EPP themselves tied to their accreditation. Um, let's see, what else do we do? Let's see, some things that we are, you know need to be aware of for new grade band changes. Um, candidates that are starting to get to the end of their um, lower and upper elementary programs are ex uh, expressing some concern, frustration, and even anger sometimes about the inequitable costs of the test taking between them and secondary, um, secondary candidates, but they do appreciate, they have vocalized, they appreciate the ability to retake only the segment that they don't initially pass. So there's, you know, a give and take there. Um, proposals, we talked about um, how in some EPPs we've proposed building the cost of test taking into course fees and other options for possible financial aid to be able to cover those, those tests taking at least for an initial attempt. Uh, let's see, I think that was about everything that we, uh, and, and of course we had some questions about how many institutions require their candidates to take, at least take the MTTC and attempt it before being approved for student teaching and what that looks like as far as the approval for that candidate to student teach. So that was basically what we addressed. Okay, so I'm representing the deans and directors, and uh, we went off a list of questions that were generated, I think, from the survey that uh, we had put out for DARTEP before uh, we came together, 
And um, one of the questions or statements was just innovative strategies from MDE. And we interpreted that as um, does MDE have, do they have suggestions for what they've seen as being innovative or ideas for us? Um, and so uh, they suggested that the slide in their uh, PowerPoint program listed some programs that they have seen that have been effective. So refer back to those. Um, they have not seen the competency program take off in Michigan, although it has in other areas. Um, we did talk about uh, fewer world language programs through teacher ed. So uh, not that there isn't Spanish or other world languages offered in institutions, but not as many uh, that are getting certified. Uh, so the suggestion that world programs and EPPs maybe even be part of a consortium uh, program that can uh, provide more opportunities. Um, also a demand for sustainable programs came up, um, uh, associates that leads like a two-year program that leads to a four-year program with a certification that's more seamless and wouldn't recommend uh, or wouldn't uh, require more than four years. Um, let's see. Oh, um, based on these innovative programs that we're sharing as institutions, uh, we suggested that maybe we have a regular survey or a uh, like a living document to continue to um, add what are the programs that we're offering. And then as we're collecting the data, analyzing it, what's working, uh, and so on. So to just be sure that uh, we're all updated on what we're doing um, and um, one of uh, the deans said, you know, I, we're doing this, but I don't know if anyone else is doing that unless I talk to someone uh, at DARTAP. And so uh, we thought uh, that having a document would be a good way to collect that uh, information. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Uh, I think I'm going to just go into some of our concerns about, um, let's see, uh, we talked about the background check process and that, uh, like we talked about concerns about liability, like even, even through trying new innovative programs uh, that, you know, some schools are are really uh, concerned about liability and that that can keep keep us or some schools from um, being innovative. Um, although then the point was raised about um, alt programs that, you know, right now maybe we're, we as traditional EPP programs aren't worrying about, but with the alt programs, um, they are going to need to be innovative. Therefore, that um, maybe should prompt um, us really leaning into being uh, innovative. Um, let's see here. I'm kind of losing my. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so background checks process. That was uh, another main topic. Um, we have one school, Wayne State, that runs uh, background checks every six months. Um, if I was understanding correctly, Michael said that, it, it, just correct me if I'm wrong, um, that Oakland has the P-12 schools do the background checks. Um, and so not like less hands, I don't remember how you said that, but fewer people, um, getting hold of the background checks, but relying on the schools to do that, P-12 schools. Um, uh, Western Legal Council states that their EPP cannot address charges. I think that came up earlier. Uh, let's see. Um, also, uh, making sure to communicate to students at the front end of the program that they will not be getting um, hired 
by P12 schools if they have an offense, even if they're in the process of being expunged. Um, so uh, wish, uh, Western suggested that they communicate that through a form and have students uh, sign it to, uh, so that they acknowledge that they do know that information. Uh, and then last, uh, a question was asked, how have you been? Seriously, how have you been? And um, so then I got a couple uh, people from MDE to, to answer and uh, one person said very well. So I pre appreciated that grammatically. And then another person said, uh, Nadia loves her new employment. <laughs> so very positive. Thank you. Great, thank you. I'm the somebody from field placement and uh, wasn't aware that I had to read the uh, report out, but here I am. Uh, <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, it seems like we covered a lot of territory in our discussions. And the first one was, um, do you pay your mentor teachers a stipend? And if so, how much? We um, There is a um, document out there from Audra Slocum from uh, Oakland. And uh, this survey was circulated. We're circulating it again. It's on the Google Doc. And um, Audra is the new director of teacher at OU. So we thought we'd gather this information. What we did discover is that um, the mentors stipends range from $50 to $160. And um, out of state, we um, pays up to $350. The University of Michigan Ann Arbor actually provides a university card that um, gives the mentors uh, discounts that are available to what I believe is their staff and faculty, right? Um, then we had questions about the grade bands and discovered there is uh, documentation out there that begs our attention in order to actually uh, make this viable and it's the clinical experiences document page 17 and page 20 which um, indicates that flex hours can be used there were questions about art music and phys ed and the number of hours for the internship hasn't been changed yet and we know that art music is in the process of being updated another uh, question was how are institutions managing stipends uh, and basically we what we all agreed on is that you work through financial aid and we get uh, spring information from the students in the email. Uh, we discussed about, uh, there was a question about the consortium agreement with other colleges. Uh, Cornerstone University shared their experience and if we need any other documentation, please email MDE. Um, how are you working with partners regarding subbing considering the stipend? Uh, there is no, no change uh, except for the long-term subbing. Partners are figuring out the cost. In some instances, the stipend isn't as high as being paid. Um, how much do you pay supervisors and cooperating teachers? So they actually, this relates to supervisors, and uh, that depends on how that payment is being made it, uh, and how many uh, student teachers that the supervisors have. Um, we collected that data previously and we're going to try to collect it again so we can do comparisons. Um, what strategies are being used for placement for grade bands with the districts? So flipping the placements between PRE and ST, uh, we have two seven week experiences at U of M UMD. We have remote lab school placements early on in literacy with small group tutoring. This ensures a big group placement tied to an ELA course. Appre apprenticeship placements uh, six times entails the first three experiences and another example of the course in the same building with clinical coaches. In some instances, students can request where they're placed for four sessions and some choice in other programs too. Um, we use the apprenticeships to consider mentors for the internship experiences as we move forward. We also discuss diverse placement processes, repeating in the same district up to two times or within the same site across two semesters, 
various process that made our partners choices and students may choose to reach out with principals. We did discuss the fact that we do have to be considerate of the different districts as if you're in a rural placement versus an urban placement, you don't have the same opportunities or the large number of schools to be placed. So we do have to consider those types of placements. We also considered the K process for telling the narrative in instances when the students are placed in the same context across the program, uh, which again uh, alludes to where the placement is, whether it's an urban setting, rural setting. Um, there are challenges with social studies teachers, and there's just not enough placements to accommodate the number of students who are majoring in social studies. Uh, so we did offer the alternative that perhaps using the Atlas videos, which is allowed, students can pay for the subscription fee in place of the text, uh, the textbook or course fee. Um, affiliation agreements was our next topic. Perhaps uh, we can use an MOU in, in place of an affiliation agreement. Uh, partners may request uh, to the affiliation agreement MOU process or perhaps the forms do not have to be used for those one-offs. So occasionally you get a student and uh, that student needs to be placed in a situation where you don't have an agreement. So what is the best way to handle it so that there's no liability? And then the final question was, um, what's on your mind regarding student mental health needs? And we found that more students are asking for more accommodations such as more time and more time and more time. Uh -huh. uh, so um, many of the students, um, they're in, uh, we, we understand that COVID now has placed a, a new cultural norm. And I think one of the things that we discussed is that we have to open those lines of communication and remind the students that there was a COVID time. And yes, we were being empathetic and compassionate and understood what you were going through, but please be mindful now that even though COVID is still with us, we are not in that same cultural situation. Therefore, we have the requirements for moving forward. You have responsibilities. You need to understand time management. So we need to have those conversations to remind them and ourselves of what's going on. Um, we also, for many of the students, their entire college career has been uh, an unusual compassionate situation. So now we have to help them handle how to grow out of that and meet the new expectations or meet the expectations which we understand to be normal. Um, the University of Michigan uh, issues a newsletter that uh, goes out. It's called Not a Newsletter. And uh, it goes out every other week and it lists, it lists free resources to remind the students of what they can do if they're feeling stressed out or if they need time management support, I'm assuming. And um, we have that at the University of Michigan Dearborn also. It's a, it goes out, but you know, I, I just wonder how many of them even read it. It's just, and it's important to do it because we, we've got to do something to keep them mindful. But uh, keeping that line of communication is what's most important. And that's it. And thank you very much. Well, with that, we'll full closure, but I also invited Mike to come up and say a couple words because this will be Mike's last DARTEP meeting with us before he starts his new job. And as he's walking up here, I want to thank everybody that's helped put this meeting together and a reminder that our next meeting is virtual because it's in the middle of winter and it's going to be easier to do it that way. And then we'll be back face to face at Hope. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. Long day, so we'll get out of here real soon. Just a few words of thanks. Um, for this space and opportunity and certainly the friendship over the years. I'm not going uh, to be totally out of the picture. I'll just be a mile over the river in Windsor. So please do uh, keep in touch. I will look to collaborate on around research and other things. So um, I'm not leaving you, I'm just going somewhere else. Um, you know, for those who are new, DARTEP is really important. I'll never forget the day in Holland when Beth Kibitsky threw me under the bus by nominating me and hearing 300 people it seemed like it was probably 100 um say uh, you know say yeah you're nominated and you're you're now the chair um uh, so it, it was really gratifying to work with other chairs over the years and so if you're new really stick to this organization it's really going to help you get connected md is wonderful too great partners 
the evolution of our relationship with MD has been so incredible. Where else do you get the leader of an organization wearing socks to honor the prime minister of the person who's uh, now leaving? <laughs> you know, that's the kind of relationship we have. So um, for those that I'll see a little later, um, uh, we'll continue that conversation. But otherwise, just thank you. And uh, I wish you all the best and hope to keep in touch.